Welcome to CEO Corner. My name is Sarah McGrath, partner in 360 Search Recruitment Services in Ireland and the UK, and I work with senior executives and CEOs helping them build their teams and also find their next career move. I'd like to introduce our next guest, Anthony Brennan, CEO of Zurich Insurance Ireland. Anthony was appointed CEO of Zurich Life Assurance in 2009 and CEO of Zurich General Insurance in 2016. Anthony spent 35 years building his career, all of which have been spent with Zurich. Anthony has been instrumental in the growth of Zurich in Ireland. He led them to a 10% market share in general insurance and 20% market share in life assurance. Anthony is a fellow of the Society of Actuaries and has gained practical experience in managing IT, finance, compliance and business development. Anthony is former president of Insurance Ireland and is currently still serving on their board. I look forward to listening and understanding what has gone into building his 35-year career. Welcome to CEO Corner. Thank you. So Anthony, you have spent 35 years with Zurich, so I would love to learn about your earlier years and, and really what went into to building the career that you have. Yeah, looking back, like, it's hard to believe it's 35 years. It's something to have gone by in the blink of an eye. But going back, and I did great for my children, they kind of trying to describe what Ireland was like back in those days. My 35 years even starts earlier than that, back actually in school. Okay. A bit sad, and I was in kind of, I think it was about third year in school, we did these aptitude tests. I wanted to be a pilot, I wanted to fly the world, you know, all that sort of stuff. But the answer kept coming back, actuary. Oh, actuary, okay. actuary. No matter, no matter what test I did, it came back with actuary. And at the time, I actually had no idea what an actuary was. I liked maths, I was good at maths not the theoretical side. I love to sort of applied maths, applying the problem, getting solving problems. So actually it was a thing for me. And again, showing my age, I distinctly remember in sixth year, pulling out the golden pages, which is just, <laughs> for those of, us, those of you online who've never heard this, it was a book with all the phone numbers in it and getting the name, of all, name and address of all the insurance companies and writing to them all, looking for a job as an actuary. Again, back then, 20% unemployment in Ireland. Like Ireland was a grim place back then. I got one or two replies, including one from Zurich that said we're not hiring this year. Okay. So, moved on. I was very close to, I had an offer from UCD to Electronic Engineering, I had a phone call from Zurich to literally say, actually, we're growing, we'd like to maybe recruit, went along. I went out and I remember cycling out to Black Rock, which was a leafy suburb at the time, for this interview, and meeting what was Zurich and loving it. Mm -hmm. I'd been absolutely loyal when I got the job offer from them. Back then Zurich were, I didn't realise at the time it was a disruptor. You know, there was about 60 or 70 people out in Black Rock all your insurance companies were long established names in Ireland and tended to have large direct sales forces. Zurich set up and was only going to deal through brokers. There really was 60 or 70 people in their 20s. Our CEO was in his early 30s. Okay. That was unheard of back then and because all your CEOs were in their 50s and 60s, you know, and had worked it again, had worked it up me 20, 30 years. So Zurich was a disruptor back then. It was a great opportunity. I went in and because of the number of people and because of the level of the growth that we went through, we had a chance to try so many different roles yeah. along the way. I don't know where the 35 years have gone, <laughs> but I remember loving those early years yeah. and the energy and passion from those early years has kept me going throughout those 35. Mm. And did you know, was there a point when you were you know, in your career and you said, you know what, I'm actually, this is a real opportunity for me, I'm going to do this. You know, did, did that was there a moment or was there a time frame? I'm showing my age now again. Back then, if you got into a good company, you thought to yourself, I'd love to stay here for, I'd okay. love to stay here for life. <laughs> and as I said, I didn't know the word disruptor back then, but yeah. then I realised we were a disruptor and we were going to have great fun doing it. Yeah. Little things like, I was the treasurer of the Sport and Social Club mm -hmm. after okay. about three years. Great fun, we worked hard, we played hard, and we were very, very successful. Yeah. But at the same time, we saw Ireland really taking off. Mm. So Ireland from the 80s really, really, Actually, the 90s weren't great either, but towards the end of the 90s, you saw a difference in Ireland, and I could see then that Zurich was really well placed. Yeah. And a transformational thing for us was, up until then, we'd been owned by a company called Eagle Star in the UK, mm. very traditional insurance company. Um, I always remember going, to, going out, out to visit them for some training, and they, this was in the late 80s, they had different dining rooms depending on levels of, you know, the directors went to one dining room, Managers went to another, and junior people like me went to the lowest one. And they were actually on different, wow. you know, the, the ground floor was the lowest. There was a top floor canteen that was only for directors and people like that. We were so different to that. Yeah. We became part of the Zurich Group in 1998. And I immediately saw a transformation mm. in the opportunity that was there for us. Because mm. Zurich, well established, 150 year old Swiss company, financially very strong, and actually needed a base in Europe. 
and we became that base over yeah. a period of time. And that opened up enormous opportunities. And if I had any doubts prior to that, I could see that the, you know, there was nothing but opportunity for people like me, and Irish people in particular, we did very, very well from the Irish business, have taken on many roles in Zurich over yeah. the years. In my line of work, it's just so rare that I, you know, today that I see and meet people that are firstly with the company for their whole career and, and, and reach CEO level. I think, you know, the, the, the fear for staying in a company is potentially becoming institutionalized and it's, it's, it's a logic thought why somebody might come to me and say, look, I want to move on, I want to experience another company, I want to see what it's like out there, I don't want to become institutionalized. And I've no doubt that opportunities have presented themselves outside of Zurich for you over the years. What is it that kept you there? And I guess, have you ever concern, had a concern about staying in the one company and, and, and would it hinder you? Or obviously not now at CEO, but at some point, did you have a concern? I was very lucky along the way and that I never got to a point where I felt I was doing the same job for too long mm. or that the opportunity wasn't there for me to move on to the next, next role or the next level in the company. I'd probably break my career down into almost like seven, five year stints mm. in which I did a very particular job and then actually moved to a very different job after that. Again, the growth that was there both in, in the company in Zurich and in the Irish economy meant that there was always opportunity. Yeah. And again, as I just said earlier, then when you joined Zurich, all of a sudden there was all these global opportunities to get involved with. And they were always there. And I always felt yeah. that it was very, very, very fairly treated. As I said, whenever an opportunity came up, I was given the chance to, to go for it. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, you know, got it. Uh, at various times, we, we all have lulls in our career. I do remember one time back in the, ooh, it must have been the mid-90s, things were slow, the Irish economy had slowed right mm -hmm. down again, and things were just a bit slow. I had been working in the original IFSC, which was, the, you know, which was you know, set up again around that time, very different to what we see today. Uh, in theory, you had to have your office down the IFSC, down yeah. the docks and all that yeah. sort of stuff. We, we, we actually were still out in Blackrock. Don't tell the government, we were still out in Blackrock <laughs> at that time. And we were, we were actually involved in a big opportunity with Eagle Star in the UK. Um, a, a, a large UK building society had launched in Germany and had big plans and we were going to be their insurance provider from, from Dublin. And it was a big, but surprise, surprise, the Germans didn't take to an English building society okay. which had its symbol as a, a bowler hat and a, and, and a briefcase. <laughs> Just didn't go down well with them. So for about a year, I really wasn't sure what was going to happen next, yeah. and I did look around at that time, and I'll never forget going for an interview with one of our competitors, one of our peers, one of our competitors, um, for a senior actuarial role, and their appointed actuary went in and met, and we had a great chat. But at the end of all, he actually said to me, he said to me, look, look, you know, great, you could do the job, but your heart's not in it. Your mm -hmm. heart is still in Zurich, and I thought that was a, that was very honest of that person, and, and it was true. Mm -hmm. So I went back, and almost, literally, I've, to this day, I'm suspicious he may, have, he may have made a phone call to somebody more senior in Zurich at the time and said, look, this guy's looking, at, and he doesn't really want to go. And I got an opportunity to move across to a major IT program, okay. literally, I would say, within two or three months of that interview. And again, that put me on, a, on another road within Zurich and just gave me an opportunity yeah. to try something different. So it sounds like you were constantly stimulated and, and, and you know, afforded opportunity, but on merit, you know, you have to, to yeah. interview for these opportunities. So um, down to hard work. And you became CEO of Zurich Life in 2009. And then within seven years, CEO of Zurich General Insurance. I've no doubt you've made sacrifices. You know, what type of sacrifices have you made along the years to, to get to this place? I think sacrifice is probably too strong a word. I think, again, I look back and it never felt like I was making any great sacrifice. I think the challenge we all have is just that balance, that work-life balance. And certainly at times, I've certainly erred on the wrong side of too much work and not yeah. enough life. Um, but I think I've always been quite lucky, again, in that brought back to reality. I've always had a rule. I try not to work weekends. Okay. I try to keep weekends free. Monday to Friday is for a fair game. Particularly pre-COVID, a lot of the industry events tend to be mm. in the evening and that sort of stuff. But I always try to keep my weekends as free if I possibly could. And again, the nature of the way it's all worked is that I haven't had to, you know, make a big, big family move or anything like okay. that. I have looked at that. I uh, had an opportunity to move across to, to Switzerland mm. and thought about it very seriously. But realised the expat life was not for me. And that again, I loved, I loved what I was doing. Yeah. I loved the fact that I was still part of something. I still feel like I'm, I'm that 20 something, well, 17 year old <laughs> who went in to a fabulous opportunity. And actually what happened at the time as well, which is very helpful, was that Zurich was growing. So it took in a bit, we took, went from about 60 to about 70 people, about 10 people went in. And we all went in at the same time. Mm. And most of us are still there. Mm. I still got that sort of core group of people. We still feel like the, we kind of can talk about 
the opportunities that we have and just how great it's been. Yeah. Zurich needed a European base as a Swiss company. They loved Ireland and it's been brilliant. They, yeah. they took to Ireland and Ireland took to it. So you've been involved in the 60 headcount to 1200. You've, you've yeah. lived it, you've lived, lived with it. and grown with it as yeah. well. Um, when talking about leadership and, and when you are building teams around you and you know, you're, you're in a position where you'll be selective and you will choose the people that you work with, what type of personalities and characteristics do you seek out and want to surround yourself with? Yeah. Uh, the first thing is commitment. Mm. And I think that's what I, you know, that I think that's really worked well for me in my career. And I want to see that commitment in all the people around me. But my key thing is to build a team, is, is balance. So I want people who can challenge and can, but also yeah. can, can accept challenge. Is, is we can all challenge, <laughs> but actually taking that challenge back and kind of doing something practical with it and you know, building on it is really, really important. Mm -hmm. But for example, I would consider myself very much an introvert, as one example, um, relatively quiet. If you get me talking about Zurich, as you can see, I could talk yeah. for hours. It's passion. Passion. <laughs> but I'd always make sure on my team there's extroverts. Okay. People who kind of are out there in the marketplace, people who kind of see that bigger picture. Also, I would see myself very much as, a, it goes back to what I said earlier about kind of my applied maths. I'm a problem solver. Mm. You know, give me a problem and I love to kind of go get out of the facts. What's the best way forward and solve it? I wouldn't be the most strategic. So okay. I always make sure in my teams have somebody who is less interested in the day-to-day, -day, current day problem mm -hmm. and is looking outwards and building that strategy view for us. So every one of my successful teams, I could always point to, the, to, to one or two people and say, they're the blue sky thinkers. Yeah. And I've one guy at the moment, I, and I've had the, <laughs> actually had a conversation before Christmas, I said, your job is to bring me 100 ideas and live with the fact I'll, I'll say no to 99. <laughs> but one of them will run with, we'll and you know that was your idea. But keep coming at me with those yeah. ideas. I love because I love people challenging me. Mm. Okay, because one of the challenges of being 35 years in any one organisation is that you can become a bit institutionalised, mm. a bit set in your ways. So you need people, new energy that are going to challenge mm. you, and that's really important to me and yeah. my team. That's an important message as well, you know, to, to put out there, and it gives people a sense of involvement and you know achievement. And I guess you know you don't have to answer this directly, but is there is there anybody you can see taking over CEO from you within your team? Absolutely. One of, the, one of the key jobs for me is to make sure that a successor to all, yeah. you know, to every role in your organisation. I, uh, I have actually stepped back from being the CEO of the life business uh, earlier on uh, in 2020, in the middle of 2020, and ha handed it over to somebody who I've worked with for nearly 20 years, yeah, who's done a fabulous job and who's, who's managed to take it to the next level again. But it's brilliant for me to be able to say that across Zurich, I'm not the only person who's got that long-term commitment. It's probably one of the unique things about Zurich in the marketplace, yeah. if you look most of the management team has spent most of their career there. Mm -hmm. Now we have, we've taken people in from other companies, but they tend to stay after mm -hmm. they arrive. They like the ethos of the organization. And every role I say to people, the first thing you've got to do is, is build your successor. Because I can't promote you until you can show me that, that somebody can step into your mm -hmm. role. And that's been a message that I've, that's been given to me over the years, and I've passed on. Yeah. And I see everywhere in Zurich brilliant people. I'm a very passionate believer in people. If you have the right people, you can solve any problem. Yeah. The wrong people, Everything's a problem. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Oh, I agree. <laughs> and the insurance industry has received a lot of negative press and mm -hmm. is still receiving yeah. a lot of negative press. Um, I guess, how do you manage that negative message personally and also as a business? Well, I, I'll, I'll go back again. I spent nearly 30 years in life yeah. insurance, <laughs> virtually no negative press okay. whatsoever. And then I moved across <laughs> into the general insurance world. And it is literally almost every day. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very, it's sad. Yeah. Because insurance is, a, is an incredible enabler of the economy. Everybody who's in business knows that they need insurance to kind of, if you're going to invest in a new factory, you need to insure, to mm. you need to insure it. So we do, I see day in, day out, we do so much good. We enable the economy. Yes, I understand it's challenging. I think the industry can do more to be more positive. Um, and I think, for example, the recent appointment of Maya Murdoch to be the CEO of Insurance mm. Ireland, somebody who came in from outside the industry, is a very positive step. I do think what's happened recently as well with the changes, hopefully, in personal injury awards, yeah. that's an opportunity for the industry to step up, to deliver on the promise mm. that we've made, to kind of pass on those savings to customers and to show that we, 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 you know, we deliver on our promises. Yeah. And what, are, what is the detail on the changes on the personal injury awards? Well, judicial, for the first time, the, the judges themselves have actually come up with the, the recommendations as to what they think are fair amounts okay, to pay. Good. Ireland is a massive outlier. You know, we were paying for over, four, over four times what the, in Ireland for whiplash, which you pay in the UK. And the UK is like double what it is the rest of the continent. So Ireland is this massive outlier. Yeah. So this is a good first step. It's going to bring us down to roughly half the UK level. It's still not 
where it should be, mm -hmm. but it's a first step. And that will be passed on. The, all the insurance CEOs have said, said publicly that we will pass on the benefits of that to customers. So it's an opportunity to build in that promise, yeah. to be a more positive uh, message to all of our customers. And then, as I said, it's a first step to go beyond that and see what else we can do to help bring down the cost of insurance. Yeah. While recognising that if something happens to somebody that is life-changing, we will still provide an award that allows them to, what's the word, fund yeah. the life and make yeah. their life, make the life as, as good as it possibly can mm -hmm. be. Yeah, it's moving in the right direction. Yeah. And I know there's an initiative that you know, is very close to you, an initiative that Zurich is involved in, and that's Tackle Your Feelings. Where did that initiative stem from? And, and, and for you, how do you manage your own mental health? The, the initiative is a great example of how Zurich works more globally. There's a Zurich Foundation, and that is sort of separate to the company. It's mm -hmm. funded by the company, but the idea is that it can make long-term commitments. So we used the charity committee internally, and it was, again, the employees, and they, worked, they went and met a number of different uh, charities and we worked through a short list and uh, I actually sat in the final, it was a bit like Dragon's Den, we had the <laughs> last three or four in to, to present to us. And I never dreamed that the Tackle Your Feelings was actually going to win yeah. because it was quite different. It was, you know, these are rugby players, yeah. like, you know, professional rugby players. And you had these, you know, very committed charities in the mental health space. But the rugby players brought to us and they, they, they blew us away at interview. One of our questions had been, you know, Ireland's quite a reserved society. Will people be willing to step forward and share their own stories? And actually, we had six really brave Zurich employees step forward at those first sessions and take us through their own stories. It made me ask myself a couple of questions because, again, I'm of a generation that doesn't really, you know, males yeah, talk about it. don't talk about it. And seeing so many of our own employees step forward and talk about the challenges they've seen has made me think much more carefully about my own, my own, my own balance. All of us need to top up every now and then. Yeah. You know, things, you know, when you hear about the latest COVID lockdown, you think, oh boy, that's the time you need just a little bit of a boost and you can yeah. get that from something like to tackle your feelings. For me, I know my, my sign, sleep. Okay. If I'm starting to lose a little bit of sleep, I'm letting the stress get to me a little bit. Yeah. And there's some good techniques, particularly those sort of breathing techniques and that sort of stuff, that just help me to say, first off, it's recognising it and then doing something a little bit. And it's the fact you can do something about it. Yeah. We can all do something to help give it that little top up to our mental well-being, And that's where tackle your mm. feelings kicks in. There's another initiative that Zurich are involved in that I, I really respect and that's a power to progress initiative where you're working with desh schools and families from a lower income background and it's to address education inequality and i guess i my very early years i i came from that environment yeah. so i understand that you know the prospect of education some, sometimes is not as clear or you know you don't believe that it's for you and since studying psychology i'm looking at the stats yeah. and the stats are saying that there's a huge amount of a huge percentage of people from lower income backgrounds that don't have the opportunity to attend third level and then those that do perhaps don't attend the most prestige colleges so what's Zurich's involvement in this and and how are you trying to bridge the gap in this area well, first up, I'm from that sort of background mm. myself, and that's where it was, this, is, this one's quite personal for yeah. me. And um, I actually, one of the schools I work with is actually the school I went to, Balancer Community School. Now, I would never in my time have seen it as a Desh school, because for me, it was just the local school we all went to, and it was, uh, I really enjoyed my time there. But looking back, I realized that the vast majority of people in my school had, weren't even dreaming of going to college. Yeah. You know, it wasn't a particularly academic school. So it was just an opportunity to give something back in an area that, you know, I believe is the great enabler. Mm -hmm. My father was a postman. Mm -hmm. He passionately believed in education for, for, for all of us. Um, you know, would have more than encouraged us to kind of get stuck in and kind of take the opportunities that were there. And I can see that for so many people that today, if you, if you don't have the opportunity, it's almost condemning you, it's locking you away from all, from yeah. all the, the, roles that are, the roles that are out there. So we were approached by, again, a very passionate, committed lady called Professor Judith Hartford. She, she is a, a, a university professor in UCD. Again, she's a very similar background, and she's worked passionately with Desh schools. And she came to us and said, look, we'd like to try something here that we think, A, can make a difference. So let's see, can we prove it can make a difference? But also to do it in such a way that it can be sort of proper research. So we can yeah. use that research to influence policy here in mm -hmm. Ireland. So like she will be knocking down the door of people like Simon Harris, telling them we're going to do this and we're going to be back to you with the evidence to show you that if we can make these interventions early on, 
we can change the lives of people in their schools. I didn't go to university myself, mm. and to me, I don't know, my, I don't know the way, I don't know where you even start in something like UCD. So they want to demystify UCD, but also through Zurich to demystify work. Mm. I think so many people from outside the industry look and say, "Oh, boring job sitting in an office." Insurance is never boring, is my mm. experience of it. There's always something new to work on, some new problem to solve. So we want to demystify work, demystify third level education, and by using some the student teachers who are trained in UCD, use them to help give us to give an unfair advantage to people in desk schools who haven't been getting that advantage for so yeah. many years. We're going into the school this September and really looking forward to making that happen. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, a point was made to me uh, recently, actually it was a conversation with my friends, and it was, a point was made, you know, look, not everybody wants to be CEO, not everybody has innate ambition where they will just do what it takes to, to get ahead, or not everybody wants to be a leader. And, you know, I think that's extremely valid. And I think you, you can be ambitious within your own yeah. remit. Where do you think, uh, well, I certainly feel like sometimes being ambitious can be a little bit of a curse because you cannot say no. You know, everything is a yes and you're just going to drown. But where do you think your drive comes from? It's a question I ask myself because I, I never set out to be, uh, to be a CEO. When I started all those years ago, my dream was to be the, the appointed actuary before I retired. And again, that's <laughs> okay. what tended to happen back in those days. You, you, did your, you did your stints at various roles and maybe two or three years before you retired, you became the senior actuary of the company, the appointed actuary. I was lucky enough to be able to do that in 1999. So everything from then has been a bonus. I think the commitment has just been though that it's, it's been, again, been part of this team of people. I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier that there's a group of people I started with. I still know many of those people and still feels like we're still enjoying the journey. Yeah. I would never have said I wanted to be CEO, but on the other hand, <laughs> when my boss told me he was, he actually went off to manage the UK for two years um, before he retired, so effectively he retired two years earlier than I expected, um, I was not going to, shall we say, not apply and not apply and put my full heart and soul into getting the job because it was an opportunity to go to take the company to the next level mm -hmm. and to see it continue to thrive. And that's what I wanted to see the company thrive. So I think my drive comes from seeing the, I, I, I'm almost like a vampire living off the, <laughs> the energy and passion of the rest of the company, of the teams, and wanting to be so much a part of that. And in every case throughout my career, it's, I've been very lucky. It's been natural. Yeah. So again, for me, it was, the I, it was the natural next step. I was ready to do it. Once good to my wife at the time, because we, I said, he, he, he went two years earlier than I expected. We had a six week old baby at the time. Well. And I remember going to her and saying, kind of, yeah, I kind of need to make a, f you know, make, we're going to have to make a few changes here. So we, you know, she made an enormous commitment. For me, it was just a natural progression and mm. something I wanted to do. I would never have said to you, though, at the start of my career, I want to be CEO. But I could see yeah, the opportunity. And I think a lot of the drive as well came from my background. And, and Sarah, you said it yourself, you're from that sort of background. To take full advantage of the opportunities that are offered to us. It's a great example to other people. Yeah, definitely. And I, I personally have done that. I think when, when I started third level education, uh, I have 10 years now. I think, I think I'm done now, you know, yeah. defying the stats. Um, just talking about empathy and leadership, you know, it's definitely topical at the moment. And, you know, the concept is that the strongest leaders have the ability to understand their team and the ability to read emotion and to have a sensitivity nearly around the feelings and, and support their team members. I've seen that type of leadership actually be considered as too soft or too kind. What is your view on empathetic leadership? I think it's the only sort of leadership that, mm. su that, that, that survives and thrives. Mm. You know, there are times when you have to step. There are times when you have to step up and say, "I hear what you're saying, but this is the direction we're going in." They're rare. Yeah. You want to bring a team with you, and if you're part of a team, you need to listen. And mm -hmm. um, the hardest part is listening, but it's also listening and then taking action based on what you hear from the listening. Mm -hmm. So we're all, we're all, oh, I'm listening, I'm listening, but yeah, we're going to do this anyway. An emphatic leader will listen and then make changes as a result yeah. of that. I think it's a leadership style. I've, I inherit, I've had some great mentors over the years. So I've had people who have showed me that that's the right way to lead. Mm -hmm. I've also had one or two bosses over the years who had more of an, you know, a command and control type yeah. style. But there are also times for that to be used mm -hmm. as well. I think particularly if, if the company's in difficulties, you do need somebody to step forward and say, with a strong vision, this is where we are, this is where we're going to, I'm going to have to take the steps in between mm -hmm. to make that happen. But most of the time when you're, when you're, when you're growing, when you've got people of passion working for you, mm -hmm. my job is to enable them. Yeah. And that's where the empathy kicks in. And as I said, I, see, you know, I started off as an actuary, 
I'd probably still describe myself as an actuary, but really I haven't worked as an actuary in a long, long time. And just some fun questions to, yeah. to wrap up the interview. So first is, what's the latest book that you read? Well, I'm reading the story of China at the moment. Okay. Fascinating country. But if you'd asked me in January, I'd have been reading uh, Barack Obama's the first, the, the first volume of his presidential memoirs, oh, and that, yes. that, that was a fabulous read. Okay, I haven't actually read that yet. It's Brilliant. Okay, yeah. excellent. And who do you admire most in the world, and why? Barack Obama. Okay. When I look at somebody who has, you know, lived the dream, mm -hmm. showed that anything is possible, but has done it in a positive way. He talks about hope, constantly yeah. talks about hope. And I'm listening at the moment, I'm a bit of an ad for, for uh, Renegades on Spotify, which is Barack Obama and Bruce Springsteen. They hear them both talking about the American dream okay. and how they've both achieved. Fabulous to see that that can still happen. Mm. Yeah, he's, uh, he's definitely uh, an idol. And if you were stuck on a desert island, what three items would you bring and why? Uh, my Kindle. Yeah. Um, a catering box of tea bags <laughs> and a kettle. <laughs> Excellent. So you're, you're getting comfy. I'm getting very comfy. <laughs> you're getting comfy. Catching up on all those books I've wanted to read for years. Yeah. But I have to have a cup of tea with me. Yeah. Well, yeah. don't forget your sunglasses. You won't be able to see now the sun. That's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, Anthony, thank you so much My for, pleasure, for your time. Great. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much.